Our first speaker is going to ask a very interesting question right at the beginning, because we're using technology for questions. We are using uh, technology to uh, have these um, um, images behind me. You're, we're using technology for you to hear me. We're using technology right now in doing our work. But do we need to use technology for everything? And um, she's bringing to, to our stage a debate and a topic that it's not very popular in Romania. I know that we have some other um, foreign guests here, so I don't know where you're uh, from. But in Romania, we don't talk so much about diversity, for example, and inclusion. Maybe in big corporation, some of you might have heard of this, but it's not such an active topic. So it's, it's going to be very exciting and with a lot of food for thought. So, Stacy, it's an innovative human capital strategist and the CEO of Rework Work. And she's basically ha have a lot of experience and focuses on global, global talent acquisition and management and has been doing it for almost 20 years, though she doesn't look like it, you'll see. Then, she's going to talk about diversity, inclusion, and career-related solutions. She has an online course, uh, and I think many online courses, that have been seen by more than one million people. So, um, she, she's been practicing a lot. And um, she's been featured in several publications, like Forbes and Fast Company and World at Work. She has a book about uh, uh, interviewing. That's also a best-selling uh, material. So with all this expertise, she's going to challenge you on how you use technology and how to bring diversity into the workplace. So please help me to welcome Stacy Gordon as our first speaker of today. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. All right, there we go. Now we know you're awake. So, Thank you so much for that great introduction. Um, I am going to talk today about belonging. And belonging takes you one step further. We go from diversity to inclusion to belonging. So even though you guys haven't really been talking about diversity, I'm going to fast track you today and get you straight to belonging because that's really the most important part. And that's where you really want to be. So uh, my background is such that, um, as was mentioned, I do have, um, let's see, is this moving? There we go. I do have a, a couple of courses on LinkedIn. Um, two of them are career related, two of them are more corporate culture related. And that is uh, on purpose because my company is Rework Work. I actually started as a recruiter and had a lot of, um, found that a lot of, it was really difficult to um, get women and professionals of color hired. So I'm coming from the United States and saw that this was a big issue. And I kept thinking, why is this a problem? Why is this taking me longer to get this African-American man hired or this Latina woman? What's the problem? And came to find that really it was that we needed more training. So I um, spent time coaching individuals as well. I've done a lot of career coaching. I still do a lot of career coaching because I do think that that is important, um, that we not are only looking at the workplace, and, but we are looking at our workforce, at our people and what are we doing for them. So we talk about humanity, right? We are humans and we need to always remember that regardless of the technology. I always like to give uh, an overview of the session as well because uh, it's a good idea for us to start from a place of understanding. We want to talk about what the um, definitions are for diversity, inclusion, and belonging. We also then want to talk a little bit about awareness. For people that maybe haven't been talking about it as much, we'll talk about why it's important. Like, why should you care? Right? Why am I standing here talking to you about something that maybe you really haven't been having conversations about? Does this even apply to you? And then we'll talk about action. And action is my favorite part because I'm a doer, 
I like to do. I usually just like to jump right in. I hate planning, I hate writing, I hate all of that. I just like to execute. So if we're having a meeting, I'm usually the one saying, enough of this and let's go, right? Uh, but there's usually somebody pulling me back saying, wait a minute, we need to have a little talk about this, let's discuss what's the plan, how are we going to execute, et cetera. So, um, but yes, we are going to talk about action because to me that's the best part. I also usually will do session reminders. We don't have to do them today because we're not doing a workshop style discussion. However, I do um, mention it here because I think it's important. When you're going to get into a topic that can be difficult, it can be uncomfortable, you have to remind people that it's a safe space. So we're going to have safe conversations. Um, and I think as a leader, it's really important for you to set the expectation that if you're expecting feedback from people, you have to let them know that that's okay. And I think a lot of times people just assume that, well, if you're in the room, they're going to speak up. If they had something to say, they would say it. Well, not necessarily, because you might not be the most open-minded of, uh, of leaders. How many of you, raise your hand, have sat in a meeting and have heard a really bad idea, knew it was not going to work, and did not say anything? Raise your hand. Raise it high. Right? Why is that? <laughs> because what's the, sometimes you say, what's the point? I can say it, and I'm going to be considered the difficult person, and then they're still going to go ahead with this stupid idea anyway. So just let them go for it, right? So if we want to have conversations, and if you actually want people's feedback, you have to give people permission to give you feedback, and then you have to trust them right, and say, okay, if I'm going to take this feedback, I'm actually not going to blow up at you or hold it against you later or penalize you for telling me the truth because I asked you. So I think it's really important um, when you're having these conversations that we mention that. The other thing that's interesting, so I mentioned that um, I have the courses on LinkedIn, and the unconscious bias course is the one that has been viewed a lot. It still has not been reviewed as much as resumes, which for all of you hiring managers, that should make you think. The, of the four courses that I have, the one that people look at the most is resumes. Why is that? Because they hate their jobs, and they all want to leave, and they're looking for something else. And those people work for you guys. But that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> Today we're talking about unconscious bias. <laughs> so um, the thing that's interesting is because the courses are global, they are seen all around the world, I get uh, in mail on LinkedIn all the time from people who say it was really great, I enjoyed it, and that's wonderful. And I don't say this so I can pat myself on the bat, right? This isn't, as my kids would say, a humble brag. Um, I say it because What's interesting is, as I read the comments that I get from people, a lot of what I get is, your course was interesting, but. I wasn't expecting to like this, but. I didn't think that a black woman would actually have something interesting to say, but you taught me something. <laughs> and sometimes I look at that and I think, wow, is that a compliment? But you know what? I take it as one. I take it as a compliment because I realize that in the um, environment that I'm const uh, currently in, that we're at a place where, um, sorry, I just realized my slide didn't move. It's coming, there we go. So um, I mention this because what happens is I see the information coming in from people and what I'm seeing though is that they are interested. In the beginning, what they're saying to me is, I didn't think that you, as a, right, fill in the blank, black, female, Democrat from the United States would have anything interesting to tell me, and I really didn't think I would learn anything. And then, ta-da, I'm surprised because I did learn something. So I mention that to you because some of you might have been thinking the same thing. You might have looked at the agenda and thought, what is this woman going to come over here and tell me about for the United States? Like, why are we listening to her? And that's okay. That's totally okay because we all have bias, right? We all have thoughts about what we think a person is going to say or do based upon how they look, what they wear, um, what their accent is, where they live. And so I mention this because I'd like you guys to be open, right? Today we're going to have 
open thoughts, open conversation, and I'm hoping that at the end, like some of these people, you're going to go, oh, wow, this was really good. I actually learned something. And if you didn't, tell me about it. I want to know because I want to make sure that this is such an important topic for me personally, but also professionally. Um, I just love being able to talk about uh, unconscious bias, diversity, inclusion, culture, all of it. So that's my open invitation to you. So we are going to start with understanding. And as I said, belonging is the, it's the culmination of what happens when you have diversity. Now you might be thinking, well, we're a pretty homogenous society. What diversity, right? But there is, uh, there's a couple of, um, I didn't include it in this presentation, but some of you might have seen the iceberg, right? If you think about an iceberg, the iceberg on top, you see a little bit, right? But you all know that the bottom, the iceberg is huge, and it's usually miles deep. But all you really see on top is like this much, right? And that's the same for all of us. What you see standing in front of you is an African-American female. But what you don't see is my culture. You don't know how many languages I speak. You don't really know where I'm from. You don't know um, demographics about me. You don't know my sexual orientation. You don't know if I have children. You don't know if I'm married, right? You don't know if I grew up poor or rich or what my socioeconomic status is. And these are all things that we, that we end up um, discriminating against or having a bias for, right? You don't know my religion. Do I go to a mosque or a synagogue or a church? Right? Those are all things that you have no idea of. So a lot of times when we talk about diversity and inclusion, it does get wrapped into just talking about race and ethnicity because that's really easy to see, right? Gender used to be a lot easier to see, but you know, there's a lot more gender fluidity now. So um, I say that because I think that it's really important to understand that you cannot get to belonging without having diversity first, and you have to have diversity of, of thought. But you can't have diversity of thought without having diversity of people. There was um, Apple's former senior vice president of HR, and I guess she was, she was their um, chief diversity officer for about eight months. And she got into some trouble because she said, well, you can have 12 blonde hair, blue-eyed men in, in, the, in a room, and you'll have diversity of thought because they may have come from different backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. And I do disagree with that statement. I really don't think you, you, you might have some diversity in terms of geography, but you're really not going to get the kind of diversity that you're looking for within your organization. So I think it's important to talk about how you get diversity, but then also what that looks like and how you get to belonging. Now, why do we want to belong? I think belonging is really important because we, have, we actually have a scientific primal need to belong. It is innate in us. We want to be part of a community. We do not like being ostracized. Please raise your hand if you like being the odd person out. Anyone? No. Right. We hate it. Not only do we hate it, but there's also scientific evidence that it affects us psychologically, it affects us mentally, it affects our health. People who are lonely, so the question is, is belonging the opposite of loneliness? I don't know, it might be, right? But people who are lonely have shorter lifespans because they don't have that connectedness. So what does it have to do with work? Interestingly, before I even get to work, uh, there was a study done by an uh, assistant professor at Stanford, and he looked at belonging to see, is there scientific evidence that belonging is important? And so, as you've probably heard, we have a few issues about race and ethnicity in the United States. Nothing big, just a little bit, right? Um, and so, we, what he did was he looked at uh, predominantly white, uh, universities, and he took African-American students and followed them throughout their progression for three years at the university. 
What he did then was made sure that they were part of a community, that they felt like they belonged. And what was groundbreaking about that is because at the end of the three years, what they found was that these students had a 50% achievement increase. Now that's huge, just because they felt that they belonged in the university. So that 50% number is interesting, because if you look at retail, same thing. You have a major retailer who did a study. They wanted to see, well, what are the effects of belonging? So they decided to take a look at, um, oh, my bad, here we go, behind. Glad I looked over my shoulder. OK, so there we go. Technical glitch. <laughs> uh, so they decided to look at emotional connection between the retailer and their customers. And when they did that, they saw that the number one key motivator was the desire to feel a sense of belonging. Now, most of you might think, I don't care about my retailer. I don't, wanna, I don't need to belong. But if you think about that for a minute, where do you like to shop? What is that emotional connectedness that you have? I can f tell you, um, I used to love to shop in uh, Macy's in Times Square in New York City. I would spend all day there. Sometimes I wouldn't buy anything, but I just liked the store. I liked the, the, the retail staff were great. They had so many different products. I knew that place inside out. If any of you have ever been there, it's about eight stories high. It's an entire city block. It is huge. That is still, to this day, my favorite store. And if I'm ever in New York, I make sure to spend, to pencil in that I have time to go to Macy's Herald Square. Why? Why do I do that? Because I actually had a connection, right? So as they looked at this, and they, so of course they're always looking at bottom line, they looked to see, well, what are the benefits? And what you see are, for any of you who have been in, who were in sales or retail would know that a 5% increase is huge. 5% is pretty good. You have a 5% increase in emotional connection, a 4% increase in customer retention, which means that you also have a decrease in having to, in, in new customer acquisition, right? You then also have 6% increase in customer advocacy. So your sales associates are working harder, they are connecting with their um, customers, and they are doing better for them. That results in 15% increase in active customers. So people who were saying, I want to purchase, right? We're going up 15%. That's another huge amount. But then here we go. Bingo. 50%. You have 50% increase in repeat customers. For people in sales, that is gold. And all they did was made their customers feel like they belonged, right? Now, that sounds like some mamby-pamby nonsense, but at the end of the day, 50% increase cannot be denied. So when you're looking at ways to increase profitability within your organization, belonging is huge. And I wanted to bring up the dollars of inclusion, because again, same thing. Some of you might have seen some of these studies. Um, I do believe that McKinsey is talking later today. They've done a lot of really great studies on um, the, um, the actual benefits of diversity and inclusion. But when you see that companies that are more diverse have 19% higher revenues, again, those are huge numbers. When you see that 70% of those companies are much more likely to capture new markets, Again, really big numbers. So these are the, some of the whys of why you need to do these things, because at the end of the day, I think definitely in the United States, we have an issue where we're saying we, we want to do this because we want to make more money, or we want to do this because it's the right thing to do. And my thought on this is that you need to do it for both reasons. You need to do it because it's the right thing to do and because you make more money, because when you put the two together, it makes sense, but when you do one or the other, it's very hard to justify it and to keep the momentum going within your organization. So, as so we talk a little bit about awareness, we're at a point where implicit bias is what prevents belonging from happening. 
So again, being the odd person out. Not a fun place to be. Growing up, um, I actually come, I have three different continents of cultures uh, in me, which you would not know just by looking at me. Uh, but I actually, my parents are from Guyana, and that is Guyana, not Ghana. A lot of people always think I say Ghana, which is a completely different continent, right? That's Africa, Guyana is in South America. It's also one of the reasons that I hate the question, where are you from? Because I never know how to answer it. I'm like, when you say, where are you from, do you mean where my parents are from, what my cultural heritage is? Do you mean where I happen to come from this morning, which is my house in Los Angeles? Or do you mean where I grew up, which is half London, half Brooklyn? Like, which where are you from do you mean? And um, for people who have different backgrounds, that question is annoying. And no one means anything by it, usually, right? Um, it usually is just a question that we throw out. But we have to start trying to find uh, new ways of conversing with people and uh, interacting with people so that we're not inadvertently frustrating folks who don't know how to answer that question. So I mention it because um, when you are in a place where you don't feel as though you fit in, Usually, it's because there's some type of bias that's happening within the company that prevents that, right? And I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, explain this a little better. So, this is funny to me because uh, you have a lot of different types of bias, right? It's not all about black versus white versus Latino, right? You, um, there are studies that show, McKinsey again has done a lot of great studies on this, <laughs> that show that tall men, get paid more than short men. So I'm very sorry for all the short men in the room, um, but if you were taller, you would be paid more. It's just fact. <laughs> um, there's actually a study that has shown that there are more CEOs named, I think it's Mike, than there are female CEOs. Now you think, let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> These are actual facts. But why is that? It's because we have a bias for tall white men who have monosyllabic names. Mike, Dan, Tom, Bob, Rob, jo you know, any of those. For whatever reason, we have a bias for it. I don't know where that bias comes from, but we have it. So when we start talking about technology, which I'll get to in a minute, um, what was said earlier is that we as humans, we are the ones wanting to use technology to do the things that we don't want to do, right? And we're programming them to replace us, but we are flawed human beings. So if we don't do this right, all we're doing is giving the flaws to the technology and putting it on steroids and speeding up the process. And nobody wants that. And blondes might have more fun, but they definitely get paid less than brunettes. Again, sorry for the blondes in the room. <laughs> so if you talk about technology, um, I really think it's important to think about the technology that we're using, right? So for me, I do a lot of my talks about unconscious bias and about culture from the standpoint of recruitment. Why do I do that? Because when you hire somebody, Usually, a lot of times, you're, you're hiring large numbers of people, and when you're hiring, that immediately changes your culture. Every time somebody leaves your company and somebody else joins your company, the culture shifts a little bit because they bring their own culture and their own thoughts and their own ways of doing things and their own processes into your organization. So if you're hiring large numbers of people, that is a really big way to affect your culture immediately. And when you look at the ways, like right now we use video technology, you know, video conferencing to interview people. We use um, lots of different, we use a, an ATS system, right? An applicant tracking system, which is again, technology. These are all things we're already using. But what is the, I think the important part about that is that they are a tool. They're a tool that is still being used 
by a human. So as an example, I had a company that wanted us to um, review all of their job ads for their, their organization because they're a um, petroleum company and they are having a very hard time hiring uh, women and African Americans in a city where women and African Americans actually outnumber white men. So if you think about the statistics of that, it's like, how is that even possible, right? So as we were looking at changing their job ads, they came to us because originally they were planning to use technology. There is a technology out there, actually there's a couple of different technologies out there that will review your job descriptions and they will point out where you have gender bias and where things can be changed to make them more attractive to everyone instead of to just a few. And um, I don't know if any of you saw this recently. This probably happened two weeks ago. There was a job ad that went out on LinkedIn. It went viral. And it said, um, Caucasian preferred. So that is a real thing. It happened. You can Google it. Um, the CEO of this company immediately said, oh my gosh, we're so sorry, we don't know how this could have ever happened, and we have fired the recruiter. Now, why did you fire the recruiter? The recruiter didn't say Caucasian preferred. Now, you might have fired him for stupidity, right, for posting that, because you really shouldn't have posted that. Not only is it illegal, but it's a silly thing to, to write. But that directive had to have come from somewhere. He had to have been in a meeting where he wrote it down. It had to have been on something where somebody wrote it down at some point in the hiring process in order for it to end up on a document that then eventually got published on LinkedIn. So somewhere in there, firing the recruiter doesn't do anything for you because the culture that would require that in the first place is still there. The hiring manager that probably made that request is still there. Nothing has changed. All that has happened is that poor recruiter doesn't have a job. So it's really important to look at the technology that we are using and remember that we are the people, the humans, underlying that technology. So we have to remember that technology is a tool. Um, technology works well when it is interspersed with us as people, and when we are creating trust. So remote workers, for example, there's a lot of debate about whether or not remote work is good. People say, oh, people who work remotely, you know, they get to work from home, they're much more productive because they're not spending time gossiping at the water cooler, and they're not spending time you know, going off for Starbucks runs. They're at home and they're working hard, right? But then there are some statistics that show that remote workers are isolated and they're not as productive because they don't feel like they're part of the team. And so they're not getting the information that they need. What we're actually finding is that remote workers work best when they have first worked in an office with the people that they, as part of their team. And they've gotten to know each other, they've learned their working style and their working habits, and they have built trust then they can go work remotely because now I understand that when Ramona doesn't respond to my email right away, it's not because she's ignoring me, it's because it's 10 o'clock and this is the time that she normally takes her break, right? Or this is the time that she goes to pick up her child from daycare and she'll be back in a half hour, right? So these are the things that happen is that you have to be able to use technology with the human component. Did it change? No. Nope. There we go. So the other thing about needing to have uh, belonging at work is that, since this is a technology conference, I thought this was a great uh, reference, in that when you are busy wondering what your coworkers think about you, they're wondering, when I leave early to go pick up my daughter, do they realize that I am still working hard because I come back home and do another two hours worth of work, right? If I leave to go to a doctor's appointment, am I being seen as the person that is skipping out on meetings? 
Um, if I'm not being included in project meetings or plans, right? There's all of these things that are going on in our heads. And it's like battery life, right? All of you probably have a phone in front of you. And it's really annoying when you leave the house in the morning and your phone is at 100%, or heaven forbid, you forgot to charge it, and it's already at like 70%, right? But for this analogy, let's say you're at 100%. You leave the house, you get to work, and it's already at 80%. Well, that's kind of what it's like for people who don't feel that they belong in their workplace. They are spending energy in the background. These apps are working in the background, and it's draining their battery. And so instead of being productive, and instead of thinking about all the innovative and great things they could be doing, how they can get 50% gains in sales, they're wondering about all these other things that shouldn't matter in the workplace. So what you're getting from your employees is 50%, 70%, but you're not getting 100%. So when you create a culture of belonging, you start to get 100%. And that's where and why productivity goes up, profitability goes up, retention goes up, recruiting expenses go down, training expenses go down. Because you get to a point where people are in the green instead of in the red. So you really have to ask yourself, something you can do is go back to your workplace and ask your teams, where are you on this scale when you come to work? You in the red or are you in the green? So let's get to the fun part of the presentation. So I happen to, there we go. Uh, LinkedIn is big for me, right? Um, obviously, I make a lot of money through LinkedIn, so I appreciate LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> but I was an early adopter of LinkedIn way back when. I think LinkedIn started in, I don't know, 2003 or 4, and I know I was on LinkedIn by the beginning of 2005. So I've been on LinkedIn for a long time. And this picture is actually an old picture, but I keep it because this comes from, I want to say, maybe eight years ago. Um, but one day I was recruiting, and I realized, I said, you know, I pride myself on being this person who is, you know, this advocacy for diversity, right? And at the time, well, actually, no, this was before that. I had worked in New York City and um, thought it was fun because I had office mates, one who was an Orthodox Jew and one who was a lady from Ireland. And we used to jokingly say, you know, what happens when, you know, a Jew, a black woman and an Irish woman walk into a bar, <laughs> right? And we'd say, well, actually we wouldn't because Barbara is an Orthodox Jew and she doesn't drink. <laughs> I know, cheesy, but we thought it was funny. So I used to spend a lot of time thinking, like, oh, I got this. I know what I'm doing. I know, you know, I love everybody, right? And then I looked at my network and I thought, huh, you know what's missing from my network? Asian people. I didn't know anybody Asian, which just it astounded me. I was like, how is that even possible? But I sat down and I started going through my network and I was like, I don't know anybody. You know, like really know anybody. So I happened to uh, make a friend who happens to be Asian, and I, we hit it off, and I told her, I said, you know what, every time that you go out networking, please invite me. I don't care what it is, invite me. And I started going to all of these different events. And what was great about it was she was there to introduce me around and meet new people, but even if she wasn't there, I would just go. And I started to open up my network, and I realized that, that is something that we all have to do. We have got to be more open. So if you were to look at your LinkedIn network right now, what would it look like, right? Um, who do you eat lunch with every day? Do you eat lunch with the same two or three people every single day, right? Who do you drink a beer with? We talk about drinking game, right? You leave out of here and you decide you're going to go grab a drink. Who would be the first person that you would want to go with? Who do you share information with? When somebody comes in and says, oh my gosh, look, I just heard whatever it is, right? Who's the first person that you think about sharing that information with? Who do you trust at work? So you'll have paper in front of you. If you were to write down the name of all of those people, right, what would they have in common? Would they all look alike? Would they all sound alike? 
Would they all work in the same place? Do they all go to the same mosque, synagogue, church? Do they all live in the same uh, geographic region? Do you all go to the same high school, same college, right? So something to think about and homework for you. So I'm very sorry to be the first speaker of the day to give you homework, but this is homework for you. I'd like you to really think about this, because if you do that, you will meet your in-group. And if you have an in-group, it means you have an out-group. Everyone else outside of that is in your out-group. And I think we made the point earlier that nobody likes to be excluded, right? So, oh, we're on there. Okay, we're on that side. Nobody likes to be excluded. So you want to think about making sure that you are starting to be more open. That might mean, you know what, next week you go back to your office asking somebody new to have lunch with you or to go do that Starbucks run that you're going to do or to have a smoke break with, right? When you get that piece of information, making sure that you're sharing it team-wide and not just with the one person you happen to really like on your team, right, who now has an advantage over everybody else. It's really starting to think about how can we make little incremental changes in what I'm doing so that um, we can be more open. And it sounds really simple, but there's scientific evidence of why this works. So exposure and socialization is, um, there's actually this um, program called, gosh, what was it called? Oh, Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman. I used to love this show. It doesn't come on anymore, uh, but I happened to catch this episode, and the episode was called, Are We All Bigots? And I thought, wow, that's a really interesting title. I need to watch this show, considering the line of work that I'm in. And what was very interesting was, in that, um, that episode, they actually showed the results of scientific study that was done. So, I'm a big proponent of, of the science behind diversity, inclusion, and belonging, because it is there. And what we found was, um, as part of this study, what they did is they took rats, right? And they were, um, the color of the rats didn't matter. I know these are like black and white rats, but really it was about their traits. They had a, a, a strain, right? Like it was like strain A and strain B. But for purposes of this discussion, I'm going to give them colors because it's much easier to describe. So we can just call them red and green, right? Let's just say that they took red rats and they put them into a little container that had a, um, what would you call that? A little trap, right? And they got taught to let the other rat out of the trap. So the red rat sees the other red rat says we're part of the same uh, strain, hits the lever, lets them out. Green rats do the same thing. Green rat sees a green rat, lets them out, they're part of the same strain. When they tried it and with the green rat, would it let the red rat out? No, and vice versa, because they, didn't, they weren't part of the same strain, right? So what they did is they took all of those rats and socialized them. They had them live together for a little bit, and then they tried the experiment again, except this time they did not use the same rats. They took the red rats, let's say, that were part of this experiment, and put them back into the container with new green rats they had never seen before. And what do you think happened? Did they let them out of the little trap? How many of you think, yes, they let them out? OK. Yes, they did. They let them out. Why did they let them out? Because they said, hey, you know what? You're part of this strain of rat I happened, I met your cousin, and he was cool, <laughs> right? So I'll let you out too, because you're probably cool. And that's how this works. So it's a very simple process, but it works. Um, and so, and the reverse was true as well. They, they did it with the, you know, the other sets of rats. So it's really um, important to realize that something as simple as meeting new people, talking to new people, trying new foods, um, listening to different music, just immersing yourself in something different completely changes the way that you will interact with others around you. So, yeah. So finally, I'll say this. Um, we want to look at the exposure and the socialization, right? So recognizing that we have biases, um, and where do they come from? So if we identify what those biases are, I'll use myself as an example. 
a lot of times, um, I used to walk into a room, and I do a lot of networking, as I said, I go to a lot of different places, and the first thing that I would do is I would look around and I would look for another African-American or black person. Why would I do that? Because of the comfort level, because of the, the in-group, right, that we just talked about. So if I'm walking into a place where I feel uncomfortable, I look around for comfort. But I don't do that anymore, and if I do feel it happening, I stop and I think, right? I stop and I say, why am I doing this? Why do I have this feeling? Why am I feeling uncomfortable? And I say, well, you know what? It's because you're in a new space. Go talk to somebody. And once I go talk to somebody and we have a conversation, it's all good. But it's just that initial reaction. It's like, oh, right? So we all have that. We all have that bias in us, and that's just fact. It's not bad, it's just factual. And it just means we have to do a little bit of work uh, to get over that and to move to that next place. So we have to think about what those biases are. We have to dissect those biases. And something else that works, also scientifically proven, you might have heard um, that back in the United States, we have a very interesting president right now. Um, and he said a lot of things. He tweets a lot. Um, but one of the things that he has said, which a lot of people agree with, right? is that people from Mexico are lazy. Now, I find this really interesting, considering the fact that he managed to employ a bunch of them in his hotels, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, so, there are people who believe this. They think, oh, Mexicans are lazy. Well, in order for you to change the narrative, what do you have to do? You have to say, okay, that's not logical. I don't know that to be true, so I'm going to change that word. So now, when I hear Mexican or Hispanic, I'm going to think hardworking. And if you actually say that to yourself, and then actually do it, it completely changes. You basically reprogram your brain. And now you are associating a new adjective with this group of people. And so it's something that we, just, we have to do, um, is to be able to create that new story. Another example, I love to use examples because it just helps visualize. Um, I stole this from somebody. I saw it in a study that I was reading. As you can tell, I read a lot of different studies. And the author of the study, this was her personal experience, and she said, you know, she was in an airport bathroom, and there was a, a European woman in front of her with her daughter. And the daughter was probably five or six years old. The daughter had to go to the bathroom really badly. So if any of you have ever had a child with you who is doing the pee-pee dance and is like, I have to go, like right now, right? That child is hopping up and down, she's got to go to the bathroom. So the bathroom stall opens, well, one of them, because you know, airport bathroom, right? You've got like 10 rows, right? One of them opens up and she starts to dash to the bathroom. Her mom grabs her back and says, We'll wait for the next one. So the daughter's like, but, I, okay, right? So next stall opens, and they go in. What happened? Well, the first stall, an African-American woman walked out. The second stall, a Caucasian woman walked out. Now, the woman didn't say anything to her daughter. All she said was, we'll wait for the next one. But that allowed inferences to be created for that child. Who knows what that child thought? I don't know, she might be thinking, well, maybe she was wearing a red skirt, and my mom hates red, so that's why we didn't go into that bathroom, right? I mean, there's a number of different things, but the point is that inferences were then made, and that's how bias gets created. Because this poor child is thinking, I had to go to the bathroom, and the only difference between this stall and that stall was who came out of it. So when we think about how our biases get created, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter why they got there. We really just have to want to be intentional about removing them. So and in order to do that, we have to recognize it. It's kind of like AA, you know? You, you have to admit you have a problem <laughs> in order to fix it. So it's really important. And so you know, creating a new story, like I said, you create that new story, you put in a new adjective, and it helps you get to that next place. So I'm going to leave you with this final thought, which is that technology is a tool. It's an awesome tool. 
Um, I love technology. In fact, I'm working with um, a company right now to create content for virtual reality so that we can actually um, do some unconscious bias training. But this is what sort of prompted this whole conversation in my head was the idea that as we sit down to create this content, to go into this technology, if we don't do it right, we are basically just going to take our bias and impart that on everybody else that actually that goes through this training using this technology. So it's really important to remember that technology is a tool, uh, but that human connection, the human input, cannot be replaced. We have to, at the end of the day, um, in fact, this just happened yesterday. I had a Facebook ad that needed to go out, and it was about cannabis, because it's HR. So some of you might know, in California, they've decided, you know, we've legalized weed, right? smoking pot. I know, we're behind Norway and everywhere else, right? But <laughs> um, there, because we're doing this event for HR managers about how to, um, how to deal with this in the workplace, Facebook wouldn't allow us to publish the ad that we created because their algorithm just scanned and saw what we put out and immediately said no. Now that's technology, right? At the end of the day, we had to put in a complaint, and a human had to go and look at it and review it and say, oh, you know what, this algorithm is wrong, it shouldn't have caught this, yes, you can publish it. So that's really my um, commentary about technology, is at the end of the day, you still need human review, and we still have to um, remember that what we, what we put in is what will come out, but on steroids, if we don't do it right. Uh, so, just in summary, we definitely have a primal need to belong. Uh, it's important to us. And um, bias prevents that need from being met. So, if we want to get to belonging, we have got to attack the bias. We also want to be able to foster a culture of inclusion. And to me, this is a leadership development skill. If you can't create a culture of inclusion in your workplace, if you can't figure out why people aren't speaking up in meetings, aren't giving you feedback, aren't talking to you, that's a leadership development issue, right? That's not just about diversity and inclusion. You have to be able to, to manage this uh, as, as a leader. And as I said, you definitely can counter uh, stereotypes with counter-stereotyping, by creating your own new narratives and reprogramming the way that our brains are wired. And so, um, you know, technology alone isn't going to do it, but at the end of the day, as humans, we've done a lot of really awesome things, and I know that we will be able to counter this as well. So, I am uh, at the end of my presentation here. I'm going to just go to the last slide. And for those of you who haven't seen uh, the Unconscious Bias um, LinkedIn Learning, there's a, a bit.ly to it. You can check it out. So thank you very much.